<clears throat> Hi, everybody. Just getting set up here. Hello. How you doing? Oh, good. We get we're getting some folks to show up. I figured after the first week we might not get much of a group, but this is a good. Uh, this is this will be good. All righty, let's see what we got here. Um, let's get out of that view there. That's, <clears throat> there we go. Key to Oak. And I'll pull up the chat over there. That works well. What else do I need to do here? That's going to be good. Okay. Stop it. <laughs> All righty. So it's one thirty. I'm going to get going here in a, in a minute. I'll just give it one or maybe two more minutes for folks to show up, but, uh, after that, I'm going to get going because I want to get through this and get your thoughts on some stuff, and then we'll uh, we'll proceed. Let me share my screen for you all. And how do I get back to? Okay. So we are. Where are we at? We're in week one and a half. So let's do this. Let's uh, pick up where we left off. We were talking about um, premise. Premise was your reading assignment. So <clears throat> how did everybody feel about La Hushegri? <laughs> Any thoughts on that? I think I think he can be a little, um, I don't know, maybe long-winded is not a good word, but sort of, you know, a uh, lot to take in, um, real flowery. But, um, his, I mean, his chapter on premise, I think, was the, the most complete, succinct, uh, definition, I think. And um, none of the other books seem to really go as deeply into that topic as he did. So that was really important for you guys, uh, I think, to hear Lahush's, um, you know, side of that story. So, and the key points uh, were just how, whatever you want to call it, um, your proposal for your story, you know, what are you, you know, what are you offering your audience? What, uh, what conclusion are you uh, trying to get to? Um, and so you can call your premise theme, thesis, root idea, central idea, goal, aim, driving force, um, you know, any one of those, uh, any one of those, those definitions that he gave it, as long as you find it, right? That was his, that was his really, his, his crux of his final thought was, Whatever it is, as long as you find it and understand what that under, underlying tone for your whole piece is, and you work in support of that theme throughout, and you, then you can theoretically reach your natural conclusion of your story and have it line up with the whole point in the first place, right? Um, so, I mean, you could think of some of your favorite um, movies in that context and, and see if... Um, you know, see if see if the premise lines up with uh, the actual story, you know, like, you know, who could tell me what the premise of Star Wars was? Anyone? I mean, do you want to take a stab at it? I mean, I don't, well, I suppose you could be wrong, but you probably won't 
be wrong um maybe just degrees of rightness in terms of what you you know think the the themes are and i say themes because i think there might be a couple of them running underneath uh what george lucas was trying to say i mean the first one you know obviously is it's a coming of age story right it's a story about a young man he's you know adopted by his aunt and uncle he doesn't know who his real parents are he's only he only has these legends of who his family is or was you know um and through the process of self-discovery and experience he starts to uncover the layers of his real truth right and so he learns that his father wasn't uh you know this heroic jedi warrior instead he was someone who lost their faith turned to the dark side and became the antithesis of the jedi uh belief system and then he's led to believe that he's an only child and then he finds out in subsequent installments that he is actually one of a couple of different siblings right he learns the truth about who his father is and then he has to con confront that whole thing so there there could be several themes running through this family is one of them and you know you could say what about family well you can say they are what you, they are you can't pick them but you got to learn to understand them and you got to learn to live with them in in some way shape or form right coming of age or growing up um so that's you know making the transition from should we say childhood to adulthood and in those transitions what what happens to our uh our our preconceived truths about ourselves and about life right um and then the plot is you know uh kid runs off with obi-wan learns how to use the force and defeats the evil empire right that's the plot but that's not really what the theme of the movie is is it you know, I mean, blowing up the Death Star is the culmination of the first installment, but, you know, the movie's not really about that. That's just sort of, that's the wrapping paper around the gift that's inside, which is, you know, uh, coming of age, learning the truth, embracing um, faith, maybe, you know, because he learns about the force and he learns about aspects of life that are greater than his immediate concerns, which are Tatooine and selling junk for scrap and learning how to harvest water from the sand and racing his pod car on the weekend with his friends, you know? Um, so this is what we're talking about. So it's like, you can, you know, you can almost have any kind of scenery you want. And then, um, you know, the theme is going to run underneath that and support the framework of the story that you're trying to tell. So here's another really obvious example, right? Uh, Titanic, right? James Cameron. So he's going, uh, yeah, it's about the SS Titanic and it's faithful, fateful evening uh, on the transatlantic crossing when it hits an iceberg and sinks and almost everybody dies, right? Okay. And so we all know that story already. So why do we go to this movie? Because his movie about the Titanic is not really about the boat sinking. That's just kind of what happens in the process of him telling you what. There's a different theme going on in Titanic. What is it? Take a stab at it. I have not seen the movie, so I do not know. You haven't seen Titanic? No. What? Not. Man, you need to get out of this meeting right now and go to Netflix. <laughs> what? It was an Academy Award sweep and he gave his best picture award and said, I'm the king of the world. You don't remember that? Oh, for heaven's sake. Get Netflix, please. What do you think? Anybody else? Just so you know, I think a lot of people might be getting locked out of the meeting. That I had, I had to quit and join twice before I got in. 
let's see if I can do anything about that. I'm, I'm not getting my admit. I usually get a pop-up window when it asks me if I want to let somebody in the meeting and I'm not, uh, let's see if yeah, I stop I, screen I, sharing. Yeah, that happened, to, that happened to me too. I sat in the waiting room for about five minutes and then I quit and relaunched the meeting and sat in the waiting room for about five more and then quit and relaunched the meeting and I got in. I'm really so, glad you said something because I didn't get the pop-up window, but when I sort of induced it to show up, I got, yeah. I got a window. So technology, you got to love it. Yeah. I and I can't like, for the life of me. Here we go. Yeah. It just seems like there were not many people here and that that was probably yeah. going to be a reason why. <laughs> right. Yeah. It was like, well, I guess everybody just turned it on autopilot and went to watch uh, whatever the Flintstones or whatever. <laughs> Um, yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for saying that. That's, uh, really helpful because I dropped the ball. Cool. Okay. I think that's gonna, I think that's gonna do it. Is everybody here that wants to be here now? Looks like, uh, looks like we might be okay. Okay, so now we've got, uh, yeah, looks like we got quite a bit more folks here now. Thank you for that, appreciate it. That's being on the ball. I'm getting all wrapped up in my presentation here and not checking. Let me do this too, will you, reminded me. Let me just take a quick, turns out this thing generates a an attendance report. But I do that for backup anyway. So Zoom lets me know who's here. That's how I'm uh, adjusting your attendance, by the way. Um, I'm going to get the Zoom report. It tells me who was there uh, and for how long they were in the meeting. And if you're in the meeting, you know, for most of it, uh, you get the attendance credit and you don't have to worry about it. If you pop in and leave after two minutes, um, you know, uh, you're going to have to watch the lecture video to get your attendance credit. Okay. And then do that so, as an assignment. So if we're here, we don't have to submit anything for the assignment. It's for here? just no. covered. No, okay. not for here. Not for here. No. In fact, I'm, I think I'm also going to offer an incentive uh, when we start workshopping. And I was thinking about this and I, I think it makes a lot of sense uh, is I'm going to offer for anyone who wants to uh, workshop their material in one of these sessions, I'm going to give you a, a point of extra credit on your final grade. Now you only get to do that, you know, once in the semester, unless we've exhausted the pool of people who are interested in sharing, and then we can start the list over again. But I think that'll be a good incentive for, for folks to come in and share, because it's really about, um, you know, talking these things out. So um, I'm going to turn my chat off. So what, what that's going to require is uh, that if you have a comment or a question that you should just speak out. Okay, guys. So let's get, shall we get back to uh, what we were discussing um, about the premise of Titanic? So anybody else want to take a stab about what, what he was really, what story he was really telling Cameron? Was it the story about the heart of the ocean? The jewel. That was Bill Paxton's storyline. And that was that was a parallel, we call it a parallel storyline. So we have three, well, yeah, kind of three, but mostly two storylines running parallel to one another. We have the uh, present day storyline where it's all about uh, Bill Paxton and his research company, and they have uh, gathered this team together and they've done all this research on the boat and they're, they're looking for it and they found it with echolocation and they're going down in a submarine and they're, and they are going to try and, uh, rescue this jewel that is supposedly, uh, still in, uh, the stateroom of this wealthy aristocrat who, who, uh, uh, survived the, the sinking and claimed his insurance claim against the jewel and became fabulously wealthy. Uh, and so he thinks that this gemstone, this uh, necklace is still down there hidden in the boat somewhere. And the legend was that it was a part of a larger, um, uh, it's a, uh, it's not an amethyst, it's a, uh, it's a blue gemstone. And 
apparently it belonged to Louis the 14th who, who uh, carved it up into smaller uh, pieces. And one of the pieces was heart shaped and he made it into a necklace for his queen. And it was passed down through the, 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 the centuries and so forth. And uh, it was extremely valuable. That's one parallel narrative, but that's not the principal story that Cameron's still trying to tell. So what do you suppose that was? Would it be a love story? Yes, it's a love story between. Uh, yeah, Jack and Rose, right? Jack and Rose. Yeah. It's a love story, right? Because we already know the boat sinks. How are we going to get people to buy tickets and go to the theater and watch a story they already know? The boat hits an iceberg and it sinks and everybody dies. Well, most everybody dies, right? Unless we have these other mechanics working, the parallel storyline about Paxton and the gym in present day. And then we've got all of this, this love story that he tells in flashback. Here's my pop-up window now. In flashback mode, he tells us this, the love story of Jack and Rose, which is not something that's part of the history books. It's, it's a totally contrived narrative that he came up with. And, and he's using the backdrop of the, the, the HMS Titanic and the, and the fateful evening in the iceberg as just sort of window dressing to sort of get you to come in and take a look around at his story, right? Okay, but it's really, so the premise of Titanic, I think most people uh, would agree that the, the real premise of Titanic was, was you know, uh, love, you know, that lasts beyond uh death you know true love right uh and we kind of see that resolution of the premise in in one uh particular way um you know at at the end of the movie something really important kind of happens right and she we get this nice montage of we see the the hearth in her in Rose's home in present day. And it's, and it's the photographs that represent a life that was spared in this horrible moment and a, and a life in service to a, to a memory of her dead loved one, which is to take every possible advantage of every moment that you're given because life is fleeting, right? Jack, sacrificed himself towards the end of the movie by letting go of her piece of driftwood so it wouldn't sink and so that she wouldn't uh, try to, you know, he knew he was dying, right? He's in the water and he's freezing and he knows that she loves him and, you know, emotional knee jerk true love response would be if you're going to die, I'm going to die with you. Right. And he knows this, he knows this. And he says, no, in his own mind, he says, no, that's not what you were meant to do. You were not meant to become death like I am. And so he sacrifices himself, he lets go. And he makes her promise not to let go, right? And so it's, it's about love, true love, love that's lost, and then you know living your life to the fullest uh, in reverence to that memory, right? And then at the at the very end of the movie, you know, when she's very old and she's a, she's, you know, ostensibly on her deathbed as well, because in the next scene after she tosses the heart of the ocean, which she had the whole time in secret and didn't tell anybody, and she throws that artifact back into the ocean. Um, that uh, you know, in in essence, she she buried the memory of that existence, right? She buried it. She put it to rest symbolically, reverently, tossed it in the ocean. Paxton wasn't going to get it because all he cared about was what it was worth in terms of money, right? What that heart of the ocean meant to her was it was, it was the keystone of her entire life prior to the boat sink, you know, up leading up to the boat sinking, you know, including, you know, the husband that was abusive and, you know, negligent, right? Um, so this is what they're talking about, right? And so the idea is that if our stories uh, have the possess these uh, these elements, that um, 
it's it makes for a much more rewarding experience for the audience than simply talking about the boat sinking. I'm trying to get that window out of my way and I can't seem to do it. it do you guys see this uh, attendance window right here? Okay, you just see my presentation screen? Oh, good, okay, good, good. Then I can work around that, okay. So uh, start thinking about this. And so you're gonna have an assignment, uh, you know, next week, I think it really comes together. But this week, all I really want you to do is, is come up with some story ideas. In the course of this semester, we're gonna create some documents, okay? And ultimately, I, th I think you're gonna be able to have um, two scripts to show for your work in the semester. You'll have a, a TV episode or a web TV episode, and then um, a portion of a feature script. And we can't do a feature script in you know a, a half a semester. Um, it's just not enough time. But you could do you know one well developed scene from a feature script that you we you presumably will write in the future. And that will be your second script project. Um, so for this assignment, should we be doing the web TV ideas or the feature ideas? In the, in the first half of the semester, um, let's think small. Let's think about either web series or TV series episode, right? And so I'm going to talk to you about that next. Um, so, uh, but before I do, I want to just say a couple of things about story structure. Um, so. Uh, we're talking about the three act structure. Um, and so um, Linda Sager in her in her book is talking about the story spine, right? So you had beginning, middle and end and the focus on that from Aristotle. Uh, and then I showed you the sort of whimsical quote by uh, Epstein about all story is, is, you know, uh, having a hero, putting the hero in the tree, throwing rocks at him, and then getting him out of the tree, three acts, right? Done. And so, but if we, if we start thinking about story structure and we start thinking about it in terms of the medium you're going to be writing for, it's kind of starts to make sense. And you can use these tools to help you with your framework. Uh, Linda Sager is using a very, um, rudimentary analysis of, of three point structure. And she's saying act one and act two and act three are story arcs and you can have parallel or uh, subtextual uh, plot lines going on if you want. You can have, you know, circular plot lines going on. In other words, you can have more than one uh, act two trough if you really wanted to. Um, but if we think about television, um, we're going to find that this three act structure here fits pretty well. And there's another I want to talk to you about, which is Michael Hoag's uh, take on the three act structure as well. But here, let's just talk about it in terms of the setup. And then the first turning point or inciting incident. Okay, so we have a setup, we have a world, we have characters, and then something happens to launch our story into motion, right. And then we have this whole second act where we have the conflict and the confrontations and we have maybe you know a, a you know a secondary inciting incident or we have a maybe we have a a, a flip-flop uh in the um the character's objectives or um you know something along those lines that lead us to this point which is what we uh, refer to as the climax. And in this moment, we're going to have a decisive moment where things are either going to go the way of the hero or they're not. And then after that, we have this long sort of resolution, uh, which is the declining action. Um, it's the wrapping up of loose details. Um, it's the summing up of where we are, where we're at, and it's the giving up or the finding your second wind and we have a little point right down here where we can have that sort of um, resolution, right? The realization. Um, and then depending on how much time you have, you've got this little sort of um, reflection, uh, we like to call it, uh, portion of the, of the story structure where the character now, you know, takes into context everything that's happened and comes to some sort of um, 
meaningful conclusion to their experience, right? Um, so that's kind of how we're dissecting the three the the three act story structure. Now, Michael Hogue is taking the three acts and then he's splitting it up and he's creating finer points in each of these acts. He's saying each act might consist of multiple things that are happening, right? So in the first act, we have, uh, we find the characters in their natural world and we, it, we see them functioning in that world as adjusted characters to that environment. Um, but with them, but then at the very end of the act, right before, uh, you know, we think that there's not much more we can say, bang, something happens, an inciting incident, okay, a new situation, in other words. And that brings us to our first uh, division, which leads us into act two. And act two is going to be all about understanding or recognizing the incident, deciding what action to take, maybe vacillating about your decision. Do I want to deal with it or not? Yes, I do. And then putting that plan into motion and what happens, right? And that takes you all the way to a climax. And in the climax, we see, you know, the plan has played out. Uh, these are the individuals that have been affected by it. Um, there's one of, you know, one of two outcomes and we think it's one. And then we 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 take we start taking the the denouement we call it the the slow steady uh, slope that declines into a comfortable resolution right, and it's the wrapping up the summing up of of everything that's happened and that's a, that's a pretty um, coarse comb to brush this story out with um, even even the six the 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 six stages of of uh, Michael Hogue's uh, structure. Um, leave a little bit to be desired. In a couple more classes from now, I'm going to show you even more uh, ways to um, to look at and think about story structure. And we got some guys that are breaking this up in, into like 25 stages, you know, of all kinds of, you know, uh, milestones for the character to reach as they go through the narrative and they sort of tick off boxes about what's going to happen to this guy from the beginning to the end. All right. But for now, I want you to think about the three act structure and that's because um, we're going to be talking about TV. Okay. So TV is all about uh, structure. Uh, what we have here is a really great quote <laughs> by Chuck Slocum, which is television is everything that's not a feature film. <laughs> and that's kind of true of today, right? Because maybe 10 years ago, that wasn't true because TV was its own entity and there wasn't as much um, media ubiquitous in the landscape of our society. Now I can watch programs on the gas pump at Shell if I, you know, you know, if I'm really paying attention, they've got video content running, uh, like programming on the on the gas pumps. Have you guys seen that stuff? Um, so we want to think about three types of television. I want to talk about episodic television, serialized television, and what we call uh, the MOW. That's something that disappeared from the landscape for a long time in television because uh, theatrical um, uh, presentation dynamics and economics got really good for a while for, for the movies. And people were going to the theaters a lot. And so if they go to the theaters a lot and they're not home watching TV, which is what you know the thrust of the marketing was for television in the very beginning, um, then we're going to get them for shorter periods of time or shorter attention spans before they run off out of the house and do something else that's fun, right? So uh, the programming was was short, you know, half an hour um, fair, you know. So the news is a half an hour. The um, the well, daytime soap operas could be a half an hour or an hour, depending on what it was. Um, game shows, half an hour, right? Uh, episodic television during prime time, half an hour. 
Um, they would have some one hour dramatic content on television. And then they would have the MOW. The difference between the MOW, which is stands for movie of the week, and a TV show that has one hour content is that the TV show that has one hour content is either episodic or serialized content. In other words, the stories relate to one another from week to week in some way. Uh, whereas the MOW is a one-off, right? So once upon a time, uh, we had, um, where's my cell? We had something called the movie of the week and every network had it, right? It was like, uh, before we had, uh, you know, 300 channels of television and before we had a 24 hour news and entertainment cycle, uh, we had a 12 hour and the 12 hour wasn't even getting filled with content at that point. In other words, the networks would sign off around midnight and, you know, they had enough uh, premium content to fill the majority of their uh, programming schedules. But then, you know, to pick up the slack and fill in the gaps, they would they would have these these one hour movies of the week and they would usually stage it in a time slot that wasn't as productive as a primetime time slot might have been. Uh, during the week, let's say. So prime time during the week is anywhere from eight to uh, eight to nine p.m. starting, right? So eight to nine or nine to ten. Uh, seven to eight, a lot of times was reserved for um, reruns uh, or for lead ups, like they would show the last episode of the TV show from last week before they show you the current episode, um, stuff like that. And then eight to nine was the premium prime time spot. That was when they thought most Americans are watching television from eight to nine for entertainment. And then after nine, you start losing your audience to people that are going to bed. Right. But, uh, but that wasn't happening every day. So Monday night, there was a movie of the week. A lot of times there was a movie of the week Sunday. So you got, here's uh, NBC Monday night at the movies. Here's ABC Sunday night at the movies, right? CBS Sunday night at the movies. Right. And there was also, I think at one point, a Thursday night uh, movie of the week. Uh, for a while. But then as broadcasting, you know, got better and it evolved and we created more channels and more content, we slowly but surely, we we lost the need for having this sort of filler content. Uh, and the movie of the week kind of went the way of the dodo bird. Um, but now it's kind of coming back because we can have a one hour television movie and we can present it on a channel like Hallmark. So you might get a one hour movie on the Hallmark Channel. The Hallmark Channel might be, you know, 24 hours a day of MOWs. And so they can put 24 movies on TV every day or, you know, minus commercial breaks and advertisements and stuff. Uh, so what cable has done is created channels where the MOW will live again, kind of in another form, an evolved form of the one hour and now two hour. Um, standalone content, one story for an hour or two hours. Um, so if you think about the kind of script you're writing and then think about the structure that you're going to use, the three-act structure works really good for episodic or serialized content. Um, it's okay for the MOW, but the MOW, I'll explain to you in a minute, uh, needs a, a finer uh, tooth comb to sort of tease, tease out the story. Um, and that's because of the time allotment, right? So episodic television, probably 30 minutes, okay? So happy days. Was happy days a half an hour or an hour? I think it was a half an hour show. Uh, all the same characters every week, but every week the story is completely separate uh, from the story they showed you last week and the story you'll see next week. So it's its own story, but it's in the half an hour framework with all of the same characters that you see every week recurring, right? The serialized content, let's say Little House on the Prairie, okay? Again, the same characters every week, uh, the same world every week, just like Happy Days, the same world every week, Milwaukee, right? Little House on the Prairie, uh, Walnut Grove, Minnesota, uh, same characters. Uh, and then what happens to them in that hour uh, may relate to something that happened to them last week in that hour. 
And if it doesn't relate directly, it relates somehow indirectly. Like, you know, if Michael Landon's character uh, repairs the barn uh, last week, uh, then this week when we see Little House on the Prairie, we're not going to see the barn broken again. We're going to see the barn repaired. So in that sense, the world is evolving and we're seeing it evolve because it's a serialized piece of content. So do you understand the difference between those those two nomenclatures. So episodic means same characters, same world, but individual separate narratives every week. Serialized, same world, same characters, and the stories relate somehow week to week. They could either be uh, directly chronologically related, like something happens to Laura Ingalls in uh, uh, January week one, and in January week two, um, the consequences of what happened last week start happening to Laura this week, right? And so it keeps going, or, you know, there was a whole storyline at one point where she get, grew up and got married, and so it was sort of the progression leading to that story, parallel storyline, and every week you saw it get, you know, more and more advanced. So serialized content, the episodes relate to one another. And then the MOW is a one-off standalone, one world, one set of characters, and one narrative that you're only going to see this one time for an hour or maybe two, and that's it, okay? And interestingly enough, the MOW had a, sort of a, it had a two-pronged uh, value to the networks. Uh, a lot of MOWs were also what we call pilot episodes. And a pilot episode, anybody know what a pilot episode is? You're going to learn this next week. Anybody know what a pilot episode is? It's like the first like TV we're show. trying to launch a series. And it's it's the first, the yeah, exactly. It's the first episode in a proposed television product that will be either episodic or serial. And if it doesn't get what we call picked up, right? It stays in MOW and it's in the network's catalog. It's something they can show uh, when they preempt uh, some other TV show, for instance, for some reason, you know what preempting means? Preempting means you got a regularly scheduled TV show, right? And things are going fine. Um, but you got a real narrow schedule where what you shot last week is airing this week, real tight, right? And then somebody in the cast gets COVID-19 and they can't work. Well, now you don't have a show to show this week. So we, that creates a, a gap in the time slot, right? Black air, no good. So they'll take that time slot and they'll go to the catalog and say, what do we got that 60 minutes that we can slug in on Tuesday night because so-and-so from such and such a TV show got COVID-19 and they're not shooting. Oh, we got an MOW that didn't get picked up from last uh, sweep season in September of last year. Let's slug that in and show it and keep our ratings going and everybody's happy and we don't have dead air. And that's what the MOWs do. They serve a sort of a dual purpose. They're a proposal for a, a longer running uh, piece of content. And they're also uh, a, a serviceable piece of content that the network can use for things like preempting. Um, at the end of a season, let's say there might be, there used to be a couple of weeks between the end of a, an actual television show's season and the holidays at Christmas time. And so uh, every week, you know, say you were watching a show uh, from uh, February through November, and it was on every Tuesday night at eight. Uh, but now it's the holidays, right? And your show is over. You already had the uh, the the season finale episode, um, but there's still a slot open now on Tuesday night, and they got to put something in there. So that's when you start seeing reruns, and you start seeing uh, old television pilots that are now MOWs that get put into those time slots because they're thinking as well it's the holidays anyway, they're probably out Christmas shopping. We already showed them the season finale. So for the, the diehard hardcore viewers, we'll give them something to watch at two for, you know, Tuesday at eight, but it's not going to be the show. The show's not going to come back. It's on hiatus for the holidays. It'll come back in February, you know, after sweeps week and sweeps week was always in January. It was, they had one in January and one in September. And that's where the network would show you in all these empty time slots, 
all these p proposed pilots and MOWs while you're still enjoying the holidays. And depending on the ratings and the feedback from the audiences, they'll take all of those pilots and MOWs they showed during the sweeps in January, they'll pick a couple to turn into TV series and those will go into production starting in February, right? And so that that's how the TV world kind of worked, right? And so it's based on this structure, episodic 30, serialized 60, and then MOWs in an hour or two hours. Um, I was going to show you Michael Hoag's interview about screenplay structure in six minutes. It's loaded into web courses, and I think that you guys should probably check it out on your own. Um, it's screenplay structure in six minutes, so it's a six minute long video. Um, and this is Michael Hoag. I'm going to refer to him uh, off and on throughout the semester. Okay. Um, okay, so blah, 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 the types, the times and durations. Okay, so I just described to you what serialized and episodic and MOW means. Talked about movie of the week. So uh, now we have cable TV. We got, uh, what does is, um, what is, uh, Bruce Springsteen say? There's, there's 300 channels on TV and nothing to watch, something, something like that. Um, we've got stuff like Netflix now. Okay. Netflix is, um, I think Netflix is the next frontier of television. And, and, and a lot of people think so. Um, a lot of directors like say Steven Soderbergh, for instance, really embracing the idea of Netflix, uh, for, for several reasons. Uh, Netflix is an independent, uh, webcaster. They have no television presence, okay? So they're not taking up any FCC bandwidth uh, in that respect. They're on the internet and they offer streaming services so you can look at any product in their catalog anytime you want, which is amazing. And now they also create their own content. So they're making their own content, putting it in their catalog, and then they're buying, leasing, renting, uh, other content from various places that are, you know, available on the open market. Um, and they put that in their catalog as well. And so you can pick pretty much, you know, from a huge assortment of things to watch on Netflix, uh, which has opened up kind of this fourth dimension in terms of television, right? So we got what happens on the, on the airwaves uh, throughout the week on network broadcast television. And then we've got this whole streaming entity that exists outside of that realm like the fourth dimension or something. And everybody's getting into it now. Disney's got their own channel. Netflix has got their own channel. Tubi has their own channel. Um, you know, all the major broadcasters have their own television channels. Um, uh, ESPN's got their own channel. Um, and everybody's coming up with their own catalogs and their own content. Um, and it really has opened up, you know, the floodgates to a huge need. So that's a signal to you guys that, you know, they're never going to not need narrative content. They're always going to need stories to tell unless it's football, which is, you know, essentially reality TV. Uh, but even reality TV will oftentimes need at least a framework that the characters are working within while they improvise from episode to episode, like uh, Survivor, let's say. Um, you know, Survivor, Pacific Island, you know, the theme is you're on an island and you're marooned there and you get a couple of things, a pocket knife and a flashlight and something else. And that's it. And what are you going to do with all those things for six weeks or eight weeks? Right. So uh, interesting uh, possibilities that are, that are being opened from Netflix and then from YouTube as well. So even YouTube has their own channel now and they're creating their own original content, uh, which you can subscribe to. And everybody wants a few dollars, a few dollars, a few dollars. You know, YouTube wants, I think, $19.95. Netflix wants $14.95. HBO wants $14.95. You know, by the time you add all that up, it's it's kind of the same amount of money you spent on one premium cable package. But I think you get infinitely more content to look at for the same amount of money. So if you're still spending 150 bucks a month on television, at least you have maybe, you know, 10 different uh, sources of content that might have huge catalogs that offer way more story potential than the networks ever did. Uh, this is also something I think you should check out on your own. 
Uh, do you guys know Film Riot? Do you know the guys over there? Um, uh, they're they're awful good uh, young guys, and they they put out some pretty helpful stuff. They did a a, a small independent feature uh, the year before last, and uh, he uses that sort of as a backdrop to talk about story structure. Uh, I've loaded that into uh, web courses as well for you to check out. But I'm going to keep moving through the uh, presentation here. So, okay, we're talking about web content now, and we're talking about um, the idea that web content, when it, when it first started happening, um, there was a lot of research and there was a lot of experimentation going on. And I remember uh, when I had my production company in Los Angeles, uh, one of the uh, areas that we were gonna be working in was web content. And we were talking with, you know, um, uh, entities like um, Current TV, so current TV was out there trying to create a broadcast ecosystem where they had regularly scheduled content that would stream on the on the internet, and then they would also offer catalogs of pre-recorded content and content that they uh, sourced from outside sources, right? Um, but the interesting thing about current TV was they they were talking about a uh, a story arc of about four to seven minutes for their content, right? So television was still in the 30 minute, 60 minute sort of uh, total running time uh, mindset. And what current TV did was they did a lot of market research and they found, you know, they, they looked at things like, um, uh, you know, the average attention span of somebody on the internet. How long do they hover on a website before they get bored disinterested and move on to something else, right? And so they got answers that were anywhere from, you know, uh, three minutes to 11 minutes, really. And so they said, well, you know, it's hard enough, you know, to wrap your head around content that is a third as long as the, the shortest episode of television, uh, let alone three minutes and tell a story in three minutes that's complete from beginning to end but maybe in four minutes and let's create a window, let's say four to seven minutes. So we don't want to uh, risk creating a, a 10 or 11 minute content if that represents the maximum amount of time that viewers are going to hang out on our site, because if they don't like what they see, they're not going to hang around for the first one anyway, let alone 10 more. So let's not go that long. Let's say four to seven minutes. And so we're going to look for content, create content, solicit content that'll fit in a four to seven minute window. And we're gonna stream that on the internet at current TV. And uh, that was like the first kind of exposure that we had, at least at my company, uh, to what internet broadcasting was gonna become. Uh, and I think then all, you know, YouTube sort of became a framework for that because a lot of the same research applies to YouTube videos. So uh, there are, yeah, some videos on YouTube that are half an hour long or an hour long, especially if it's a copy of some pre-existing content like a TV show. But if it's original video for the web, tends to be eight to 10 minutes, six to 10 minutes, doesn't it? So they, they weren't too far off 25 years ago when current TV was looking at this ecosystem, the landscape of the internet and figuring out how long videos are gonna be. That's, it's still kind of ringing true. And I, that either tells me that they were really, really super smart and knew what they were doing or people's tendencies haven't changed much in terms of how they consume content. But I, I think it's a combination of the two because I know that personally my, uh, my consumption of content has changed considerably uh, in the la even in the last two years from what it was when I was 30 or 20 years old, right? <clears throat> okay, so let me move this. Okay, so we've got, uh, okay, so what about the commercials, right? So we're talking about TV. Where are we going to stick the commercials? Well, very interesting. So episodic is a half an hour. Uh, serialized is an hour, but they got to cram in something from Ford, something from uh, Maybelline, something from McDonald's, right? And then one or two uh, spots from local 
uh, advertisers that are buying in at the local level, not the national level, right? Uh, so commercials, we, we've got to account for those somehow. So how are we going to how are we going to do that? Well, what they they determined was the total running time then of this content needs to vary based on uh, whether it's half an hour or or sixty minute content, and they and they decided that twenty two minutes was the network total running time for a narrative half an hour time slot. 22 minutes of content and the remaining eight minutes is reserved for commercials. And what they would do, uh, which is very interesting, if we go back to uh, the Seder uh, diagram, is you get this little piece at the beginning of a half an hour show and then they break for a commercial right here. Right, and this piece is two to three minutes, and they call it the teaser. This is called the teaser in TV, and then we got Act Two, which is the real program, and then we have the resolution. So, in the first, say, in minute four, there's our first commercial block, right? Now, 22 minus four is 18 minutes, right? If this is also three to four minutes, call it four minutes, 18 minus four is 14. That means this piece right here is 14 minutes long in a half an hour show. We have the teaser or opener. We have the story arc, and then we have the resolution, beginning, middle, and end, okay? So that's why for television, especially half an hour episodic television, Linda Sager's three act structure works really good. Aristotle and Linda uh, Sager, they're on the same page here because she's thinking teaser, concept, resolution, we're out. See you next week, right? Works. But what happens if it's an hour? Uh-oh. I think that's why Michael Hogue came along and said, maybe we can split this hair a little finer. Maybe we can say, yeah, it's a three act structure if it's a half an hour, but what happens in a 60 minute program? And it just so happens he's got six stages here. One through six, hmm, 10 minutes each, maybe, or the network hour is really only, where's my, 42 to 44 minutes of content, okay? 42 to 44 minutes of content. So if you take what's six times seven is what, 35? Seven times seven is 49. So six and a half minute blocks maybe in the Michael Hogue six, act, uh, or six stage structure. Every six and a half minutes, something has to happen. And if you take stage one and call that the teaser, if it's only three minutes, then we can borrow back that other three and a half minutes and put it somewhere else, maybe in the middle. And then we have this sort of center point in the script, which is the turning point of the whole story. And guess what? Where do you suppose that falls in a, in a, in a network one hour TV show? Anybody want to take a guess? the bottom of the hour commercial break. Here's your teaser and here's your first commercial break. Here's your bottom of the hour commercial break. And then here's the commercial break that separates the resolution of the story from the wrap up. The one that drives you absolutely crazy, right? The minute that Columbo is gonna say, and the murderer is, now from Downey we have a uh, one minute to tell you how soft your laundry can be and Colgate, how white your teeth can be. And as the Rolling Stones say, a man ain't a real man unless he smokes the same cigarettes as me. And they used to have cigarette commercials on TV, right? And then, and only then after they've sold you on some kind of product one more time, they give you Colonel sausage in the parlor with the lead pipe. They give you the resolution to, to, to tell you who the killer is, right? And so they dissected the network hour 42 minutes long 
six and a half minutes and then they robbed a little from here and a little from there and put it in the middle to flesh it out a little bit and called it six stage structure. And then you can plan for your commercial break. So you wanna have certain things happen in your script, like around when the teaser is gonna end, you should be kind of done explaining to the audience what the world is. And after you come back from the commercial, that's when we might meet the main character and find out what his hangup is, right? And then from here in act one, to the turning point in act three, which is the point of no return, the halfway point, that's when everything the character is doing to resolve his situation culminates in this moment. And then after the commercial, we see the results of how he has expedited his plan. And that takes us on this denouement slope to the last commercial break. And then we break to hear from Downey and Camel and and Hallmark cards, and then we get to find out whether or not his effort was in vain or whether he was a success. And that's your network hour. So TV, you're writing a story that has to fit within the context of the marketing strategy, which is television commercials that are selling consumers things that they may or may not need, but that's the, that's the, cost of admission right that's the ante if you're going to watch our show for free on network television you got to listen to our commercials for eight out of every uh, 30 minutes or 16 out of every 60 minutes of programming right so that was what made uh television unique from say the features because a feature you know i watched one last night 127 minutes right? Not even, not 130 minutes. So it wasn't exactly an hour and a half. Uh, what are you going to do with that? You can't show it on TV. Well, maybe you could 127 minutes. Uh, that leaves you, uh, what, 13 minutes. Uh, they really want 16 minutes in an hour. So what they'll do is they'll, do you ever see a show on TV where they say this show has been edited for the time allotted? So they'll take that oddly timed feature film that they want to show as a movie of the week and they'll cut just enough out of the story, story points or action that you probably won't miss anyway to make room for the commercial requirement, which is for two hours, how many minutes of a two hour show are actually commercials? You got to do the math. If we talk about the 42 minute standard, then it's 18 minutes per hour, right? That's 36 minutes of commercials in a two hour show. That's a lot of time. So they might look at that half an hour movie and say, we could make that a two hour movie of the week if we just chop out six minutes of superfluous story somewhere in the narrative that the viewers will never miss. And a lot of times, you know what that ended up being in terms of network uh, exhibition? Take a guess. What do you think? What do you think they were snipping out first? Credits. Credits, yeah. What else? There's an entity that's looking at everything that gets broadcast on TV and they're making value judgments. What entity am I talking about? Anybody recognize the television censor board? So blue laws, you know, which exist even now in this country uh, were really prominent in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And the blue laws, you know, especially at the federal level, said things like, you can't swear on television. It's against the censor guidelines. And if you have uh, swearing in your movie or your show, you've either got to bleep it out or we're going to edit it out or we're just going to say your show isn't approved for uh, television broadcast. So 
some of the stuff they're looking for then to chop out of that hour and a half movie, swear words, gratuitous violence or bloody violence and sex, right? And then credits. So they have all that stuff to look for and opportunities to chop stuff out, right? To gain back the time they need for the commercial breaks, okay? But the idea is you're writing a story structured around the marketing economics of the network. So it's 22 minutes for a half an hour show and it's 42 minutes for an hour. Now, can anybody tell me how that relates to your scripted content in terms of how many pages you need to uh, supply to the network? Anyone? We have, we have a, I don't know if it's a, well, it's, yeah, it's a proven theory at this point. We have a saying in the, in the industry, one page of scripted content equals one minute of screen time. One page of content equals one minute of screen time. So if I'm writing in a half an hour TV show, episodic, how many pages do I need to have in my script? Minimum. 22, 22 pages, right? Plus a title page and stuff like that. So you, and you never want to give somebody exactly what they need, right? You always want to have a contingency. So if you had to supply a script for a half an hour TV show, and you knew that they were going to carve 22 minutes out of your show, out of your story, you'd probably want to give them a 24, 25 page script. So you have a couple of extra minutes there to play with. So if you've written in some content that maybe they look at and they say, you know, this scene's running a little slow, we can, we can cut a minute out of this and, you know, slug it into our, our, our 830 time slot perfectly. Uh, then you've given them something to work with. But if it's exactly 22 pages, then they've got to take it all at face value. And if there's something wrong that has to be cut out, like a swear word or uh, somebody bleeding the wrong way from getting shot, uh, and they need to cut that out for the censors, then basically you have given them a script that is that doesn't fulfill the time slot. So you got to give them a little extra. So you give them 24, 25 page script, and that's going to fit into 22 uh, scripted minutes perfectly. And the same thing with a one hour show. So if it's 42 minutes plus commercials, your script should be about 45 pages. Okay. And that'll, that'll guarantee that you can make it, you know, beginning to end front to back plus commercials and not have any dead air. Okay. So now we're talking about if we're writing for TV and we're writing, uh, we're writing episodic, then you need to write me a 25 page script. Now, you want to do that this semester? I don't know, maybe if you're really ginned up about writing, if it's really your thing, do it. Or you could select the current TV model, which is four to seven minutes, which would be how many pages? 47 pages. 47? No, four to seven pages. And you don't want to give them exactly what they need. So what should you give them? Uh, so I guess the max, depending on what you're going for, would be like six to nine, maybe. Maybe. Let's say five to eight. Let's say that, right? Minimum of five pages. And that doesn't include a top sheet, right? So it's five scripted pages or eight scripted pages. And that is a webcast episode, okay? So if you're doing that, I can give you a couple examples. So here's, here's a couple shows that I worked on uh, as a producer and as, as a cinematographer. I did stuff for Burn Notice on USA TV and they wanted to have a, uh, a, a, an offshoot program from the one hour network uh, event of burn notice, but they wanted it to be a, a web broadcast show. It was going to have uh, um, 
visitations by regular characters from the TV show, and then it was going to have its own set of unique characters for what they called Covert Ops, which was the name of the Burn Notice broadcast uh, webcast uh, show. So they had recurring content weekly uh, that ran parallel to Burn Notice on USA Network as a one-hour show. They had uh, a se- I think it was a seven-minute show running on uh, the internet called Covert Ops. And so we did that. Uh, at my company, uh, and I shot the uh, the first uh, the pilot episode, and I also shot a bunch of stuff for yet another spinoff, which was a, uh, a a video game you could play on your cell phone. That again had characters from Covert Ops doing things, uh, little activities that you could maneuver these characters through. Diffusing a bomb was one of them. Uh, finding a, uh, the, a secret plan was one of them. Uh, rescuing a hostage was one of them, right? And you could play this game on your cell phone. And we were shooting content for that, real video elements that were then getting animated into this yet another spinoff. And, you know, the whole thing was all virtual. It was all for the internet. Um, so um, I would say for your, you know, for this the story ideas that you're thinking about this week and for the consequent documents you're going to need like beat sheets and treatments and stuff, I'd go for, I, I'd go for like the eight page document, an eight page story that could be a, a web TV series or, um, you know, split the difference, uh, make it a, maybe a, a 15 page document that with a little extra polish could become a 22 page document or with some judicious editing could become, uh, you know, a 10 minute webisode. Right. And, and now you're kind of in between the two, right. You can, you can turn that story into a a half hour TV show, or you can pare it down to a a web broadcast episode. So I'd look for something like that, say eight pages, 10 pages. Uh, Here's another uh, web series that I worked on uh, in the very beginning. It was called the guild. I don't know anybody familiar with the guild. It, it was on for, I think, seven or eight seasons on the internet. Um, I, uh, I was uh, a location manager uh, back then uh, for the Guild. I ran a studio in uh, um, Sun Valley, California, and they used to uh, shoot this show at our, at our studio. And so um, this was all for the web. It was going straight to the web. They were shooting our red cameras. You know, we had uh, I, the, the stage that they were using. Uh, that was my A stage, which was um, eight, uh, 9,000 square foot production uh, space uh, with uh, 30 by 60 green screen, uh, pipe grid, uh, and full lighting and camera packages. And they were using all that gear and all that uh, infrastructure and assets to create this web, this web series called The Guild. And it was pretty fun. It was all green screen, you know, um, characters with actual costumes and actual makeup. And then they were in always in uh, virtual environments. So pretty interesting. Um, so that's kind of my sort of getting your feet wet uh, introduction to this process. Um, I'm recording this episode. I'll put it on there. You can watch it again if you need to, um, just to wrap your head around this. I, I decided not to show you the videos just for the sake of time. So, cause I want to let you go here in a, in a minute or so. Um, but I wanted you to get a sense of what the television industry is doing in terms of creating the content. Okay. Um, a lot of thought is going into this. Um, there are some definite structures involved. There is marketing to consider. Uh, and so all of those things together sort of start determining what kind of content you can put on TV in a time slot like 30 minutes. You know, uh, dramatic narrative kind of doesn't have enough time to unfold in 30 minutes before you got to let people go uh, and see them next week. So, drama usually fits into the one hour serialized space. And so what do you suppose goes in a half hour space? Comedy. Comedy, right? 
So all of your episodic comedy shows are usually a half an hour. Uh, you laugh real hard three or four times and they let you go and see you next week, right? It's real hard to create an hour TV show that's funny for an hour. Things are funny for a moment or two. And then we want to move on to either the next laugh or the next point you're trying to make. So comedy is really kind of by virtue of what it is and it's and the audience's response to it psychologically, uh, it fits into the 30 minute space really, really well. So if you're going to write something for the web that's serialized and it's only eight to 10 pages, could be it could be melodramatic for one really good reason. Anybody have any idea what that might be? What can you do on the internet and on Netflix that you can't do at the network level? Swear. Swear. <laughs> well, well, now you can almost do all of that anyway. They've sort of lifted all of the restrictions now. Uh, but there's something you can't do on Tuesday night at eight that you can do on Netflix all you want and certainly on the internet all you want. It's everybody's okay. favorite pastime. Binge. Binge watch. Yes. Yes. You can watch the last installment, this one, and whatever else they got on there. And you can do it all in one sitting if you want. So a web episode of only eight pages is not necessarily a failure because if you got 10 of those, your audience can sit there all afternoon and watch 80 minutes of content and it's all your, and it's your story. So if you make it serialized, all of the sudden, what's 80 minutes? 80 minutes is a, an hour and 20 minutes. I just told you I watched an hour and 27 minute feature last night with marquee actors. You're not that far away from a feature film with 10 eight page installments if it's serialized. The first eight leads to the next eight, leads to the next eight, and leads to the next eight, right? So if that's your concept, then eight pages is not a restriction anymore, is it? You're really thinking in the space of 80 pages because you're going to have 10 episodes, eight pages each. Now we got a different beast. We got a different tiger by the tail. Because now you can have a story arc that spans many episodes. And just like Game of Thrones, but Game of Thrones was doing it with an hour eight times a year, right? Eight hours of story arc per season on Game of Thrones. Each episode wasn't a standalone, was it? The first episode, John goes, why do you have dragon glass? The next episode goes, ah, because it does this. Then the episode after that is, well, who found it? And the episode after that is, oh, Sam found it. And the episode after that was, what did you do with it? And the episode after that was, I killed the walker with it. And they went all the way down the line to the last episode where he goes, oh, I can use it too and kill the Night King. Bang, end of the, you know, end of the show, right? Eight hours over the course of a season. 80 minutes over the course of a broadcast season, right? Uh, or broadcast package, right? Um, you know, we're not really necessarily referring to it as a season anymore because what, what does a season mean anymore, right? It's a broadcast package, right? So it can be comedy or drama, depending on how you want to slice it. If you write, if you write really good uh, lighthearted comedic dialogue, um, you know, this might be right up your alley to do eight pages of something funny and then do something different next, next week. And if it's drama, give us a little bit every week to keep them, keep us coming back over 10 installments. Right. In the future, I'm going to talk to you about the other, uh, ways of dissecting story structure. So we've got Sid Field. He did the, um, save the cat. I think Michael Hogue, who you're already looking at. Robert McKee wrote the book Story, which is really popular. I, I'm not pulling from McKee's work particularly 
uh, in this class, although I'm showing you some stuff from lessons from the screenplay, and he does uh, uh, use a lot of McKee's um, uh, advice. We talked about Linda Sager, uh, John Truby, and Christopher Vogler. He's the one who wrote The Writer's Journey, which is a sacred volume that almost every Hollywood writer has in their repertoire. So we're going to look at those concepts over the next uh, couple of weeks anyway. And uh, talk about that in greater greater scale. Um, it looks like I'm doing okay. Um, your reading assignment for this week, a couple of things. Uh, number one, um, I want to I want to talk about next week. I want to talk about um, story pitching. Uh, in other words, you've got a great idea, and and you and now you've got a meeting at CBS next Thursday at two in the afternoon in Burbank. And you got to talk to a studio exec about your idea, see if they want to fund it and, and, and make it a TV show. So how are you going to handle that conversation? What are you going to say? What are you going to, what kind of materials are you going to bring to the table? How are you going to present your idea? Right? We can package that up and we call it, a, we call it a pitch, an elevator pitch, um, uh, but we call it a pitch meeting. Okay, so I want you to watch this video in advance of ne next week's class. It's uh, from a writer, uh, his name is Shane Stanley, and it's called Producers Don't Want to Read Your Script, but here's what they do want. And he's talking about what you should put in your pitch package. Okay, it's a 20 minute video, and I don't want to burn class time on a 20 minute video. So if you watch it in advance of next week's class, then you'll have those sort of uh, concepts rattling around in there, and then we confirm it all up. And then I need you to read chapter one in a different book this week. It's the writing uh, the TV drama series, and it's in your library. Uh, it's a PDF, so uh, read the first chapter. It's what's so special about uh, TV drama is the name of the chapter, okay? And then I've given you a PDF to also think about, and it's a, um, it's, it's basically just a, uh, it's a whole list of assorted premises as examples, you know, uh, key points or themes behind story, right? Um, so you can look at that document and you can start thinking about premise. Premise is not plot. Premise is not story, okay? Those are three different things. Story is man wakes up, puts on clothes, has breakfast, coffee and toast, goes out, hops in the car, drives to work, fights with his boss, gets fired, right? That's And then plot is what happens in the process of that story happening. There are other things that are going to happen that are going to lead from one event to the other and tie the whole thing together. But premise is not either of those things. The premise might be, why did he get in an argument with his boss? He's not happy. So the premise might be the day-to-day -day grind of going to work at a nine to five is no way to live. That's the premise. Then the story is the guy gets up and goes to work. And the plot is what happens in the process of getting up and going to work, right? Paperboy throws his newspaper in the, in the weeds and he gets pissed off, gets caught in traffic. So he has to take some office calls on the phone and he's short with his secretary. He gets to the office and he's already boiling over. He goes in, the boss wants to see him. He snaps at the boss. The boss says, you know what? I've had it with your attitude. You're fired. Plot. Premise, the nine to fiver is no way to spend your life. It's a drag. Get out there and live your life. Premise, right? So think about your stories in those terms. Start trying to dissect it a little bit. Um, and I think that's it. So you're gonna start thinking about story ideas. I've put it up there as an assignment. Just jot them down, come up with at least three because next week after we talk about pitches, you'll have all of those to choose from. You'll pick your best idea and create a pitch package for that idea. But you should never come up with one idea and start working a pitch package. If you go into a meeting with a studio exec and you only have one idea, that meeting's going to last about three minutes. And it takes a minute to say hello and a minute to get you out the door. So you're going to have a minute with one idea. Do you really want your whole career to rest on what happens in that one minute? Probably not. 
So you want to maximize the amount of time you're in the exec's office. So you should have a handful of ideas when you go talk to a studio exec and you have a pitch meeting. So if you give him the first pitch and he says, yeah, 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 I did that already last season. Nobody watched it. it stunk. What else have you got, kid? Oh, well, that's it. That's all I have. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. If something comes up, uh, I'll give you a call. And that's the last you're going to hear, hear from that guy. Okay. But if he says, what else have you got? And you say, well, if I got this other thing, it's a half an hour comedy. It's about this and this and this. Here's a one sheet. This is what it's about. This is what I think the who the audience is. Uh, this is how the uh, the story will appeal to people. It's 10 episodes and it the arc uh, ends up with the character getting married to the person he was fighting with in episode one, something, whatever it is. Right. And then he says, well, maybe that's pretty good. You got anything else? Yeah. I got a, I got an idea for a, a, a one hour MOW. It's a one-off, but it's a pretty good story. I didn't think it was feature material, but I think we can get 60 quality minutes out of it uh, for people on a Thursday night. And it's about a guy who uh, hunts for uh, uh, sunken treasure off the coast of Florida. Oh, yeah. Hey, you know what? That, I, that might actually be a TV series. And bang, you got another meeting. Right? So at least three story ideas and jot them down in the text box for the assignment. Okay. And then you're going to work that best idea. What I'll try to do is look in on everybody and see, and I'll give you my opinion. Yeah, that's a good one. That might not work. That might work. Right. But you're going to pick your, your best idea of the three and that we're going to generate some documents from that in the next couple of weeks. Okay. Bang. 250. And eh, time's up. So anybody have any questions? All that's as clear as all, mud. <laughs> all these ideas we're coming up with, they're for TVs, no features. Yeah, let's, I mean, yeah. Let's save the, the features for after your midterm, because then I want to I want to workshop content between the midterm and the final. I want to take all that time and have you write scenes and workshop that material. And we're going to talk stuff out. We're going to talk about how your characters are developing. We're going to talk about your plot. We're going to talk about your premise and we're going to dissect those documents for that one larger project, which will be okay. one well-developed scene or maybe a couple of scenes from a feature concept, not the whole movie because that's 120 pages of scripted content. Okay. So in the beginning of the course, let's think broadcast TV or web. And then after that, we'll switch our gears and talk about features. Okay, cool. But the concepts we're doing, this is why I front loaded the class. The concepts we're talking about for the first four or five weeks apply to either situation because character development is the same, whether it's a feature or a TV show. Plot development is the same, okay? All these things are the same. The structures might be broken down more finely for a feature, okay? But it's still, we're talking about structure, talking about premise, talking about characters, character development, subtext. All the things we're gonna look at for the first four weeks, we can apply to feature writing after the midterm. And you're also gonna apply them on the fly to your TV product you're gonna produce in the first half, okay? Does that make sense? Cool. I, I hope that you guys have fun because I'm really, I'm really excited to see what you guys come up with. And if you want, I mean, I, you know, if you're worried about workshopping, I'll do it with you. I'll, I'll dig up some of my stuff, some of my student work from my master's uh, uh, program and, and I'll workshop it with you if you want, or, or I can put it up my, uh, uh, on the internet, uh, on, on web courses for you to look at and use it as an example. Um, I'm giving you some of the same documents and I'm finding you templates so that this process of creating a beat sheet, let's say, creating a, um, a treatment, creating a, a plot synopsis, uh, you're gonna have prompts, things where you just fill this the, these templates in with your information. You don't have to come up with a whole structured package all on your own, okay? I wouldn't throw you into the fire quite like that. Um, so you'll have templates to work from. And if you want to see examples of stuff that I did as a student, uh, I can show you that too. Okay. Uh, but I don't want anybody to feel uncomfortable and I don't want anybody to be bored. So uh, I'm really, I love writing. Uh, I've fallen in love with it. Uh, after 33 years being in the industry, uh, I found a new passion. And so I, I love to talk about it and I'd love to talk about it with you. So 
Um, it, but if you can't make it, remember these Zoom meetings are not mandatory, but if you miss this, you gotta watch it on uh, web courses so you get attendance credit, okay? And then if you come here and workshop something, if we have time to look at your content, you'll get some extra credit points for that. So let's make it worth everybody's while to come and, and then come ready to talk. That's like my, my, big, uh, my big ask for you guys is come ready to, to, to share and uh, know that this is a safe place to do it. Nobody's gonna tell you your stuff sucks and nobody's gonna you know, uh, think badly of you because you write uh, fantasy instead of uh, cop drama. Nobody, you know, that's not what we're about here. Okay. And we're all, we're all new at this. I'm even new at this, right? You can spend your whole life learning how to be a good writer. Okay. And so in that sense, we're all learning. Okay. So let's treat it as uh, an opportunity to, to just get better at what we're doing. Okay. That's all I got for you. So if there's no other questions, I'll see you guys uh, next week. Thanks, everybody. Have a good afternoon. All right, thank, thank you. you. I have.